Yeah, so that means we have time to come to this. So, uh, John Zinn is an independent historian with a special interest in the history of baseball. He's the chairman of the board of the New Jersey Historical Society and was the chair of New Jersey Committee on the Sesquicentennial of the Civil War. He is the author of five books, including three about the Brooklyn Dodgers, and he's also in numerous essays and articles. He writes a blog on baseball history titled A Manly Pastime that I, I recommend. And John holds BA and MBA degrees from Rutgers, and he is a Vietnam veteran. So with that, I will welcome John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the um, Historical Society for sponsoring this event and having me. Thank you for all of you uh, for being here. The topic of my talk tonight is history, tragedy, and comedy, the Brooklyn Dodgers at Ebbets Field. And that is taken from a chapter in this book about Ebbets Field that my son and I edited a number of years ago. And the idea, of course, is that just as Shakespeare's plays can be divided into three categories, the Dodgers moments at Ebbets, some of the Dodgers moments at Ebbets Field are sad, some of them are historic, and some of them are just plain funny. And I'm going to try to give you a sampling, just a few of, of those incidents that happened uh, in the years that Ebbets Field existed. Um, now, this is a talk about baseball. And the first thing you do before you play a baseball game is you set ground rules. And I have one ground rule for this presentation, which is that I am only going to talk about games that the Dodgers played at Ebbets Field. That means that I am not going to talk about the worst moment in Brooklyn Dodger history, Bobby Thompson's 1951 home run, nor am I going to talk about the best moment in Brooklyn Dodger history when they won the seventh game of the 1955 World Series at Yankee Stadium. So we're limiting in the questions, answer period, we can talk about anything. But when I'm talking, it's going to be about Ebbets Field. The other thing that we always associate with baseball is trivia. And so, of course, towards the end of the presentation, there will be a trivia question. And we'll see how you do with that against how, how other groups have done with it. Now, before I talk about any of the specific incidents, I'd like to give you a little bit of background and context about Ebbets Field. The first slide that you see here, this is a drawing done by, the name of, by a man by the name of Gene Mack. He did a series of these in the 1950s about all the major league ballparks, and almost all of them appeared in the sporting news, and they capture the characteristics and some of the historic moments at those ballparks. This is the one for Ebbets Field, and um, some of the things I'm going to talk about are, from, are pictured here. What was Ebbets Field like? Well, this picture, I think, gives a sense of Ebbets Field in its prime, in its heyday. It's the late 1940s, the early 1950s. The Dodgers are involved in a tight pennant race with the Cardinals or the Giants. It's a summer night. They're playing before a packed house at Ebbets Field. In addition to giving us a sense of what Ebbets Field is like, this picture also proves that Walter O'Malley was right about at least one thing. There wasn't enough parking at Ebbets Field. Look in the lower right-hand corner of the picture. You can see the way those cars are shoehorned into that parking lot. Imagine if you had to leave early and you were part of the first ones there. It would have been interesting trying to get your car out of that parking lot. Now, where does the name Ebbets Field come from? Well, it comes from this man. This is Charles Ebbets, also pictured in his prime. When the team known to history as the Brooklyn Dodgers played their first game in May of 1883, Charles Ebbets was there as a game day employee, probably taking tickets and selling scorecards. He would work for the Brooklyn Dodgers literally from that day until the day of his death in April of 1925, some 42 years later. For the last 27 years of his life and career, he was the president of the Dodgers and the lead owner. He made a number of major contributions to baseball during that time. One of them, just literally months before his death, in late 1924, he convinced the owners to switch the World Series to a 3-2 games format, same format that's used today almost 100 years later. He also made a lot of contributions to the Brooklyn Dodgers. One thing that Eb Ebbets did one thing twice that Walter O'Malley couldn't do once. He built new ballparks in Brooklyn. Now, we all know about Ebbets Field. This is the first ballpark that he built. 
This is Washington Park, which the Dodgers occupied beginning in 1898. Now, construction began on Washington Park on March 15th, 1898, and it was ready for opening day, May 1st, 1898. Washington Park was built in about six weeks. Was Charles Ebbett some kind of a magician? Well, he probably would like people to have thought that. But the reason it was built so quickly is that it was a wooden ballpark. Wooden ballparks, which were typical of the 19th century, have one major advantage. They can be built quickly. They have a number of major disadvantages, however, including limited capacity. And since wood is flammable, many of them burned, although Washington Park never burned. Now, the nature of ball, Major League ballparks changes early in the 20th century with the introduction of reinforced concrete as a building technique. And it enables the building of a new generation of ballparks, ballparks made out of brick and steel, that I think it is fair to say is the most beloved generation of ballparks in baseball history. It ends in 1909 with the opening of Scheib Park in Philadelphia later becomes Connie Mack Stadium, and that same year, Forbes Field in Pittsburgh. The time period continues through the early 1920s with the opening of Yankee Stadium. Yankee Stadium was not part of that generation of ballparks. Yankee Stadium is the first major league ballpark to be called a stadium. Now, I said these are this is the most beloved generation of ballparks in baseball history, and the best evidence of that is two of them are still very much in use today. Fenway Park in Boston, built in 1912, and Wrigley Field in Chicago, built a few years later, known then as Wiegmans Park, are still not only very much in use today, they are two of the most popular ballparks in the major leagues. In fact, your baseball experience is not considered to be complete unless you've seen a, at least one game in both of them. I've seen more games than I care to remember in Fenway, and it's very much true. It's really a, it's a tremendous experience to be in one of these old dead ball era ballparks. Now, one last thing I want to say about Ebbets Field, which is, is that the ballpark that Charles Ebbets built is not the ballpark that we remember from that second picture. This is the ballpark that Charles Ebbets built. The right field fence is still the same. It's very close but there are no seats in fair territory. The left field fence in the original Ebbets Field is almost 400 feet away from home plate. And that flagpole in the upper right-hand corner of the, screen, of the picture, that's over 500 feet away from home plate. The original Ebbets Field was the traditional dead ball era ballpark, a huge outfield and very few seats, no seats in fair territory. Ebbets Field changes in the winter of 1931 when they expand the seating capacity. What they wanted to do was to move to take down the outfield wall in left field and build out. And they but they couldn't do that because they didn't get the cooperation of the city of New York for the city owned land. So they had to build in. And as a result, you get the small, intimate ballpark that we all remember today. So with that, let's look at a couple of moments of comedy. And the first one has to do with this man. This is Casey Stengel, pictured here in 1916 as a Brooklyn Dodger standing in front of the famous right field wall, then before the scoreboard was put on top of it. Now, we remember Casey Stengel today as the Hall of Fame manager of the New York Yankees of the 1950s. But Stengel was an above average ball player who had a good career starting with the Brooklyn Dodgers. And on the last weekend of the 1916 season, he will he hits an unlikely home run off of Grover Cleveland Alexander, one of the greatest pitchers in baseball history, a home run that propels the Dodgers to the National League pennant and into the modern World Series for the first time. After the 1916 season, Stengel and Ebbets have a falling out. And predictably, it's over money. After two years of acrimonious salary negotiations, which Stengel chooses to conduct in the media, St uh, Ebbets has had enough of Stengel. He trades Stengel to the Pittsburgh Pirates. And so in May of 1919, Stengel returns to Ebbets Field for the first time as a visiting ball player with the Pirates. He doesn't get to, up to bat in the top of the first inning. He goes out to play right field. End of that half of the inning, he stops in the Dodger bullpen to talk to some of his old teammates. Comes into his, the Pirates dugout, gets his bat, goes up to home plate. 
He gets to home plate. He's greeted by a big round of applause. Uh, Stengel was always popular with the Dodger fans. And so in response, he doffs his cap. And what happens? A bird flies out from underneath his hat. True story. When Stengel went into the Dodger bullpen, the Dodger players gave him a bird who they thought was injured and unable to fly and asked him to give it to one of the trainers. And Stengel put it under his hat and forgot that it was there. True story. You can't make these things up. Okay. Now, as I said, after Charles Abbott's dies, the beginning of the 1925 season, and the Dodgers go pass through the late 1930s, a time when they are known for their poor play, but more importantly, for their antics, their crazy behavior, their daffiness. They become the daffiness boys. And the poster child for the daffiness boys is this man. This is Babe Herman. Now, Babe Herman is so well known for his crazy behavior that it's forgotten that he was actually a very good hitter. He had a lifetime batting average well over 300. And it's interesting to note that the, the, the highest single season batting average in Brooklyn Dodger history is not held by Duke Snyder, Collar Farillo, Jackie Robinson, or Gil Hodges. It's held by Babe Herman who in 1930 hit over 390. He hit almost 400. So he was really a good hitter, but that's not what he's remembered for today. Remembered for all his craziness. Now, since the Dodgers weren't very good, sports writers didn't have much to write about except the crazy on the field behavior. And no one got more attention that way than Herman. But one day, Herman is standing in the Dodger dugout before a game with a writer. And he's saying to the writer, this the way, way you write about me is just really embarrassing. It's embarrassing me. It's embarrassing my family. I'm not crazy. Please stop doing this. Please em stop embarrassing me. The writer gets some pangs of conscience, says, all right, babe, I promise I won't write anything more about how daffy you are. They shake hands and Herman takes a cigar out of his pocket and puts it in his mouth. The writer, in a finer gesture of reconciliation, offers to light the cigar. To which Herman responds, no need, it's already lit. The sports writer says the deal is off. Anybody who walks around with a lit cigar in their pocket is obviously crazy. Now, the famous story about Herman takes place in 1926. It's a game with the Dodgers and the Boston Braves at Ebbets Field. It's the bottom of the seventh inning. The score is tied. The Dodgers have the bases loaded with one out. And Herman is up at bat. Herman hits a vicious line drive into the vast outfield of, of Ebbets Field. The runner on third scores with the go-ahead run. The runner on second decides there's only one out, so he'll play it safe and he'll stop at third. The runner on first decides now's the time to be aggressive, so he goes all the way to third. Herman knows a triple when he sees one, so he puts his head down and he runs without paying any attention to what anyone else is doing, and so he ends up at third. And the end result is... Three Dodgers on third base at the same time. When Abner Doubleday invented baseball, he frowned on the idea of more than one runner being on a base at the same time. Two of them are out. The inning is over. It's often said that Herman tripled into a double play. He didn't. He doubled into a double play. What's also forgotten about this is that you will note that I said that on his hit, the go-ahead run scored. And in fact, that was the winning run. So the Dodgers won the game. There was no harm done. Now, this incident, unforgettable incident, leads to another story years later where a cab driver one summer night is driving through the streets of Brooklyn and he sees a man sitting on his front stoop, obviously listening to the Dodger game on the radio. So he pulls over and he says, how are the Dodgers doing? Great, says the man. They've got three men on base. To which the cab driver responds, which base? So those are a couple of moments of comedy. So I'm going to move to a couple of moments of history. And this first moment takes place in 1938. Now, this is, it starts out to be Brooklyn Dodger history, but it becomes baseball history. This is the first night game ever played at Ebbets Field. And that would have been historic from a Brooklyn Dodger standpoint. But it becomes even more historic because of this man. This is Johnny Vandermeer from Prospect Park, New Jersey. On this night, 
Johnny Vandermeer will do something that had never been done before and has never been done since, and I don't think will ever be done again. In his prior start, Vandermeer had pitched a no-hitter. This night in Brooklyn, he pitches another no-hitter, two consecutive no-hitters. Never been done before, never been done since, and the way baseball is being played today, I think I'm safe in saying it will never be done again. Now, Vandermeer, from a pitching standpoint, Vandermeer's no-hitter was no work of art. Over the course of the game, he walked nine batters, including walking the bases loaded in the bottom of the ninth inning. Fortunately, he had a six-run lead, six-nothing lead, and got out of the game not just with the win, but his no-hitter intact. This is 1938, and it's kind of symbolic of the fact that the Dodgers are now being revitalized. And it's because of two of the men in this picture. In the center is Branch Rickey, and we'll get to him a little bit later. The other two men on the left is Larry McPhail, who was the Dodger president. And on the far right is Leo DeRocher, who he hired as his manager. And McPhail and DeRocher, in a very short period of time, took the Dodgers from being in the bottom of the league to the top of the league. DeRocher once said of McPhail that sober, he was brilliant. With one drink, he was a genius. With more than one drink, there were problems. And since McPhail seldom stopped at one drink, there were a lot of problems. Now, DeRocher had no shrinking violet personality. So the two of them were constantly at each other's throats in a very combative, combustible relationship. Now, this is also the same time that we start to become aware of the famous Brooklyn Dodger fans. And the most famous individual fan is this woman. This is Hilda Chester, pictured here with her famous bell. Now, for our book, I interviewed a man who, when he was a boy, sat near Hilda Chester in the Ebbetsfield bleachers. And he said that on a moment's notice, she could go from polite, everyday conversation to language that would make a sailor blush. Roscoe, McG Roscoe McGowan, the sports writer for the New York Times, said that her voice was like the buzzer going off in Madison Square Garden. If you've ever experienced that, you have some sense of what I'm talking about. Now, of course, there is a story behind the bell. At one point, Hilda has a heart attack, which her, do her doctor attributes in no small measure to her the way she carries on at the Dodger games. So he says, Hilda, if you're going to keep going to Dodger games, don't yell so much. Find some other way to make noise. Now, of course, she largely ignored his advice, but she started bringing with her a frying pan and a ladle, and she would bang on it to distract the other team. The problem is she also distracted the Dodger players. So they chipped it and they bought her this bell. It's often described as a cow bell that I think is really more like a school bell. So she's just an example of the rabid Dodger fans. And fan support, it's important, but I mean, it's indirect. It really doesn't have anything to do with what happens on the field. Or does it? Another story the heart of which is this man. This is Pete Reeser. Now, Pete Reeser is not well remembered today, but when he came up in 1941, he was con he was compared very favorably to Ty Cobb. If you want a modern comparison, compare him to Mickey Mantle. Reeser could do it all. He could hit. He could hit with power. He could run. He could feel. He could throw. He could do everything. Unfortunately, Reeser also had an affinity with running into outfield walls. You go home tonight and watch the seven, or you watch the World Series this coming week, and you note the running track and the padded outfield walls. That's Pete Reeser's lasting contribution to baseball because they didn't have those before he started running into the walls. Before he gets hurt so badly, there's a game at Ebbets Field where late in the game, I think it's the top of the eighth inning, the Dodgers have a one run lead. The Dodger pitcher gets into trouble, but he gets out of the inning. The Dodgers come into bat in the bottom of the inning. Reeser stops for a minute along the first base side, first base sideline to talk to Larry McPhail. Then he comes into the Dodger dugout and he hands DeRocher a note. DeRocher opens the note. The note reads, your starting pitcher doesn't have it anymore. You better get Hugh Casey on in relief. Well, the smoke is coming out of DeRocher's ears. 
what is Larry McPhail think is going on here? He's the president. He doesn't have any right to tell me how to run my ball club. And he's you know, ready to explode, except he knows there's one thing. The content of the note is accurate because all he, he knew that. He knew his pitcher was in trouble and he plans to bring you Casey in, which he does. And Casey gets the side out. The Dodgers win the game. They get into the locker room. And now DeRocher unloads on Reeser, starts screaming at Reeser in front of the entire team. Reeser has no idea what's going on. And finally, DeRocher says, don't you ever do that again. And Reeser says, do what again? He says, don't you ever be an errand boy for Larry McPhail bringing notes to me. And Reeser looks at him and says, what are you talking about? That note was from Hilda Chester. So... Maybe fans do get involved. Now, 1941, the Dodgers win their first pennant in 21 years. And at the heart of that is Pete Reeser, the aforementioned Hugh Casey, and also the Dodgers all-star catcher, Mickey Owen. So the Dodgers win the National League pennant, and they're in the World Series for the first time against the New York Yankees. We go to the fourth game at Ebbets Field. The Yankees are up two games to one. The Dodgers' backs are to the wall. They have to win this game or they're going to be down three to one and they're going to be in big trouble. But things are looking good for the Dodgers. Top of the ninth, they're ahead four to three. Hugh Casey is on in relief. He gets the two out, first two outs without any difficulty. Tommy Hendricks, the last Yankee batter. There's two strikes on Hendrick. Looking really good here. Casey winds up. He delivers. Hendrick swings and misses. The umpire signals strike three. The game is over. The Dodgers win. The series is tied two games apiece. Wait a minute. See that dot at the bottom of the screen? What's that? That's the baseball. The oldest written, surviving written rules of baseball are the Knickerbocker rules, which date back to 1845. They stipulate that the catcher must catch the third strike or throw the batter out at first base. And Mickey Owen did not catch the ball. He did not recover it in time. And the Yankees are still alive. Now, this should not have been a big problem. There are still two outs. Henrik is still a long way away from first base. All DeRocher had to do was to call timeout, go out to the mound, settle Casey down, refocus him, and I think the Dodgers would have won the game. But for once in his life, DeRocher is speechless. Casey is in shock. He falls apart. The Yankees rally and score four runs. They win the game seven to four, and the next day they close out the series. Now, there are all kinds of stories about this pitch, one of the most popular being that it was a spitball and Casey overdid it. And that's why uh, Owen couldn't catch it. There is video of it. If you've ever seen the video, I mean, the ball is like three inches off the ground. I mean, I don't know how Owen could have been expected to catch it. Henrik never claimed credit for it, but it would have been a very smart move on his part just to have swung at the pitch, knowing that the catcher never would have caught it and he could have gotten to first base. So the Dodgers lose the 1941 World Series. As we know, a few months later, the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor. World War II is underway. The Dodgers are good in 42, although they don't win the pennant. Then they fall back into the bad ways of the past. War ends in 45. In 46, the Dodgers come back. They tie the Cardinals for the National League pennant. They lose in a playoff. But in 1947 comes a moment that is not just Brooklyn Dodger history. It's not just baseball history. It's American history. Because on April 15th, 1947, this man, Jackie Robinson, takes the field for the Brooklyn Dodgers and destroys the color line in baseball forever. Now, it's sometimes not as much as it used to be, but it's sometimes said that Robinson is the first black man ever to play Major League Baseball. That's not correct. A man by the name of Fleetwood Walker briefly played, played Major League Baseball in the 19th century. Robinson is the first black man to play baseball in the 20th century. But we need to understand what happened with Robinson within the context of the times. This is before Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on the bus. This is before Martin Luther King organized his protest movement. This is before the civil rights movement got underway. Ken Burns in his baseball series described this as baseball's finest hour. And it's hard to disagree with that idea. 
Branch Rickey, the one who chose Robinson, chose could not have chosen any better, not just obviously in terms of the character of the man he chose, but in terms of the player he chose. Robinson, like Reeser, could do everything. But Reeser, uh, Robinson had another quality that few baseball players have ever had, no matter how good they are. Ty Cobb would be another example. Robinson could dominate a game the way few players ever could. And this picture, not a very good quality picture, but I think it captures how he could do that. This is a game, picture of a game from 1951. And what you see here is Robinson in a rundown. And you see what looks to be five Philadelphia Phillies trying to retire him in the rundown. Now, the picture is a little bit deceiving because it's obviously a still picture. I interviewed for our book, Carl Erskine, who was a Dodger pitcher in this game. And he told me that, in fact, it's not five Phillies who are trying to retire Robinson. It's six because there is a six. The Philly left fielder is out of the camera angle and he's backing up the play as well. Now, this picture almost may also look as if as if what it's showing is that it took six Phillies to retire Jackie Robinson. But that's not what it's showing. What it's showing is that six Phillies could not retire Jackie Robinson because the Philly catcher, Andy Semenek, is about to throw the ball into left field and Robinson will score. So that, that I think, captures the kind of player Jackie Robinson was. He could dominate a game like few have before and few have since. Now, the Dodgers tied for the pennant in 1946. They're adding Robinson. They're obviously a much better team. Probably no big surprise that they win the World Series, uh, win the pennant, and go into the World Series again. And the same scenario plays out. They're playing the Yankees. The Yankees win two of the first three games. So here we are again at Ebbets Field, the Dodgers with their backs to the wall. Now, this brings me to the fourth game of the 1947 World Series. And I'm going to ask you to indulge me a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit more detail about this than some of the other games, because in my opinion, this is the greatest game ever played at Ebbets Field. I think it is one of the greatest games ever played in baseball history. One of the reasons for that is because of this man. This is Bill Bevins. Bill Bevins was the Yankee pitcher that day. Now, Bevins was, base, was a 500 major league pitcher. That is, he lost as often as he won. But on this, Bevins, is, Bevins has a very, is in a very extraordinary situation, in a situation worthy of a Greek tragedy, because Bevins has a blessing and a curse. The blessing is, or the gift is, his pitches are better than they've ever been before. His fastball is at a blazing speed. His curveball and his slider are breaking like they've never broken before. Jackie Robinson, after the game, said he was convinced Bevins was throwing a pitch he had never seen before. That's how effective Bevins' pitches were. That's the gift. The curse is Bevins has no idea where any of these pitches are going. He cannot control the pitches. And so the result is pretty much what you might think. After eight innings, the Dodgers don't have a single hit. But Bevins has already walked eight batters. He's walked so many batters that the Dodgers have actually scored a run without a hit. So we go to the top of the ninth, and the score is two to one in favor of the Yankees. Now, there's a lot of stuff that happened in the first eight innings that I'm not going to talk about. But I want to talk for a minute about the top of the ninth inning, which is all usually almost totally ignored. Top of the ninth inning. You know, the Yankees need one run, and, you know, this thing is really over. And they load the bases with one out. And the Dodger manager, Bert Schotten, decides it's time to bring in a relief pitcher. And he brings in the aforementioned Hugh Casey. Hugh Casey walks to the mound. Who is waiting for him in the, ba in the batter's box for the Yankees? Tommy Henrik, his old friend from 1941, right? Casey throws one pitch, and Henrik hits into a double play, and the inning is over. And nobody ever talks about that. You know, they talk about Casey and Henrik in 41, but I think Casey more than a little bit redeemed himself in 1947. So the Dodgers come up in the bottom of the ninth inning, still without a hit, still down a run. First batter goes out on a long fly ball to left field. Second batter is Carl Ferrillo. He walks. Ninth walk for the Dodger, for Bevins. 
Dodger manager sends in a substitute, Aljon Frito, to run for Farrillo. Next batter pops out to first base in foul territory. Dick Young of the Daily News said the Yankee first baseman's skin was as white as a sheet because he was worried he was going to drop the ball and co- might cost Bevins his no-hitter. So now there's two outs, only one out away from the no-hitter and taking this 3-1 to game in the World Series. Bert Schotten, Dodger manager, decides now it's time to make some moves. Now, th- this is Bert Schotten. Bert Schotten became manager of the Dodgers in 1947, a, a complete fluke. Literally, like three days before opening day, Leo DeRocher is banned for the entire season because of conduct unbecoming to baseball. And Schotten is drafted into service. You notice he's wearing a Dodger windbreaker. He never wears a uniform. He wears street clothes covered by a windbreaker, which means he can't go onto the field. Okay. Now, and Schotten had managed before with very little success, but he's helping the Dodgers out here. So his first move that I mentioned a few minutes ago was he put Al John Frito, a fast runner, on first base. Hugh Casey is up now. Now, Casey obviously is not going to bat. Who's going to pinch hit for, for Casey? He calls on Pete Reeser. Now, Pete Reeser is still a good hitter, but Pete Reeser has not played in this game because he's hurt. It was believed at the time that Reeser had sprained his ankle. In fact, he had broken a bone in his ankle. He had spent most of the game in the Dodger locker room soaking his ankle, trying to be able to get in, get up just to be able to play a little bit. The Dodger trainer finally says to him, there's no way you're going to be able to play today. Take your uniform off and go sit in the stands. But Reeser fortunately goes into the dug in the dugout and is called on to pinch hit. Count gets to be two, two and one on Reeser. Now Schotten decides at this point, he wants to even up the odds a little more. So he gives John Frito the steal sign. John Frito gets the steal sign. And he can't believe it. It has to be a mistake. If he's thrown out, the game is over. Bevins has his no hitter and the Yankees have this three to one game in the World Series. And to make matters worse, probably because in so much shock, John Frito stumbles starting towards second base. Now, the Yankee catcher is Yogi Berra. And if we thought about that today, we'd think, oh, yeah, he's dead. He's dead. He's got no chance at all. 1947 is Yogi Berra's rookie year. He has a great arm, but his mechanics are horrible. And the Dodgers have run wild on him the entire series. And the throw is just high enough that Gianfrido gets in underneath it. So now tying run is on second base with two outs. And the pitch, by the way, was a ball. So now the count is three and one. But what do you do now? If you're going to pitch to Gian, pitch to Reeser, you got to throw him a strike or otherwise you're going to walk him. And Reeser's still a pretty good hitter. Bucky Harris, the Yankee manager, decides it's time to go against baseball rules, unwritten baseball rules. He has Reeser walked intentionally. What's he doing? He just put the winning run on base. You never put the winning rate run on base. Reeser limps down to first base and is replaced by Eddie Mixis as a pinch runner. Now, next up is Eddie Stanky, the Dodger leadoff hitter. Schotten has pinch hit for Stanky all of one time all year. This is the second time. He calls on this man. This is Cookie Lavagetto. Now, if Branch Rickey had had his way, Lavagetto wouldn't even be on the team. Lavagetto had been a good player, but he was clearly at the end of his career. And Ricky, after the 46 season, tried to convince Lavagetto to retire and become a manager in the Dodger farm system. And Lavagetto said, no, I think I can help one more year as a, as a pinch hitter. And the results thus far had been pretty mixed. I don't think he had had a pinch hit in a month. So, and Lavagetto, when his name is called, he thought he was being called to pinch run. He didn't believe he was being called to go up there and bat. He goes up there and bat to bat. Swings and misses at the first pitch. Then comes the second pitch. And this time, he doesn't miss. I can't imitate Red Barber's voice, but the call goes something like this. Here comes John Frito with a tying run, and here comes Mixus with the winning run. And in an instant, just an instant, everything changes. Bevins loses his no-hitter. The Yankees lose the game. The Dodgers win the game. The Dodgers are tied with the Yankees. Everything changes in that one split second. 
And we know that ultimately the Yankees will win the series, but it goes to the seventh game and the Dodgers actually lead in the seventh game. There are two reasons why I think this is one of the greatest games in baseball history. One is that this is a game that came down to the last batter where both teams could have won the game. Two more strikes and the Yankees win. Labagetto's hit, the Dodgers win. The other reason I think it's such a great game is because of the three main characters, Vince Gianfrido and Lavagetto. They were the main players in this game. After the 1947 World Series, none of them will ever play in the major leagues again. And that shows the way or do extraordinary things at crucial times. And I think that's one of the reasons that baseball is such a great game. Now, I was talking earlier about Dodger fans, and I said the most well-known individual fan was, um, was Hilda Chester. The best-known group of fans is this group, the Dodger Symphony Band, emphasis on phony. And they would march around Ebbets Field playing an assortment of songs, really making more noise than music, trying to distract the visiting team. Hard as it may seem to come to believe, they somehow came, they ran afoul of the local musicians union. And it was a period of time in 1951 where they weren't allowed to play at Ebbets Field. Now, we don't associate Walter O'Malley as being somebody who had either a sense of humor or being generous. But O'Malley decides that since the symphony band can't play, he'll have music appreciation night. And so anybody, any fan who brings a musical instrument to the game will be admitted free. Over 5,000 people took him up on the offer, including a group of men who pushed a piano up to the ticket window. I guess they figured it was safe to leave it there. Uh, the re writer who covered the game for the New York Times said they may have called it music appreciation night. In fact, it was music depreciation night. Now that brings me to my trivia question, which is, who is the only person to play for the Brooklyn Dodgers in baseball the New York Knicks in basketball, and the New York Rangers in hockey. Gladys Gooding, very good. The organist at Ebbets Field and also at Madison Square. I've been very disappointed if somebody didn't get that. Gladys Gooding played at Ebbets Field until it closed in 1957. She continued to play at Madison Square Garden until her death in the early 1960s. I think she played literally up until a week or so before she died. And she was... You know, there are organ players and there are organ players. I mean, she was beloved not only by the fans, but also by the players. Um, so that comes, unfortunately, to Walter O'Malley. Now, there's a famous joke that's told about O'Malley, which is that you are in a room with Hitler, Stalin, and O'Malley, and you have a gun and only two bullets. What do you do? The answer is you shoot O'Malley twice. Now, that gives you a sense of the pain felt in Brooklyn. And trust me, that pain endures. I and mean, this was five, six years ago. I interview people from the winter games at Evansville, and they still feel the same way about O'Malley. That for, for years, O'Malley took all the blame. Now, it's a lot of the blame is given to Robert Moses. I've always wondered why Robert Wagner, who was the mayor, didn't take his share of the blame. If a, imagine if a mayor today let a team like the Dodgers leave, and Wagner didn't care. He just plain didn't care. Uh, now, the other thing that's interesting about all this is that one of the, the Dodgers were going to leave Ebbets Field regardless. Okay, the one of the reasons the Ebbets Field site wasn't wasn't practical for baseball was the lack of parking. Well, if you've ever or Ebbets Field. There ain't a hell of a lot of parking there either, right? But that doesn't stop people from coming. So that was a flawed, a flawed assumption. So it turns out that I think it's September 25th, 1957, the Brooklyn Dodgers play their last game at Ebbets Field. They beat the Pittsburgh Pirates two games to nothing, two game, two to nothing before a crowd of 6,702 people. Included in that crowd, were a woman who I was in a woman who I interviewed who said that she went there with some of her friends and uh, some of her other friends were supposed to go with them but but they they couldn't go 
because they had to go to a wake instead. And she said they missed the wake. The wake was at Ebbets Field. I understand what she meant by that, but she was wrong. Because further to have been awake, somebody or something has to have died. Ebbets Field and the Brooklyn Dodgers may be gone forever, but they will never die. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to try to respond to questions or comments, and I guess we're going to do some of this remotely. So if I'm repeating questions, that's why. So feel free. Yes, sir. The question is, besides the seventh game, which other game in the 1955 World Series did Johnny Padres pitch? I'm not 100% sure, but I would think the fourth. I don't know. Roger Craig pitched one. I, I'm not sure. He won two games. Okay. Well, Padres would have to have pitched the third or the fourth. I think it was the third. I, I, that'd be my guess, because Craig was a rookie. And down two to nothing, that would be really taking a chance going with Craig. Um, so it's probably Padres. See, it'd be easy enough to – there's a website, retrosheet.org. You can look up almost anything on there. Yes. Now, the question was, was Babe Herman the player who said he lost a ground ball on the sun? No, I, I, but the, the, myth, the legend with Herman was that he got hit in the head with a fly ball. And he said, that's not true. I get hit in the shoulder with a fly ball. Um, the player who got hit, who lost a ground ball on the sun, this is a much more serious. Billy Lowe's in the sixth game of the 1952 World Series, when the Dodgers had a chance to close out the World Series, he claimed he lost a ground ball on the sun. Now, apparently there's some truth to that because the sun was setting uh, and the sun was shining, you know, through the decks between the upper deck and the lower deck. And there's some truth to that. It's not as crazy as it sounds. 52. 52 is the year the Dodgers win the first, pay, the first game, the third game, and the fifth game. So they always have the lead. They win the fifth game at Yankee Stadium. So they go back to Ebbets Field needing to win only one game. And after, um, after the World Series, I've read this in the, in the papers of the time, Casey Stengel said, we were lucky. We were lucky to win this series. Yes. Well, the, the, the first televised baseball game ever is in the, it's an experiment in the late 30s, early 40s. Red Barber was the announcer. You Are you thinking of Happy Felton's not all gang? The, the Dodger announcers through the, um, at the time they left, it would have been uh, Vin Scully, who was very young. Um, I'm blanking out on the other guy's name. Yes, Dempsey. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. And uh, he said his, his friend got so upset at the wheel 
that he was driving crazy. And my father, you know, the famous wait till next year. Well, let's hear how what next year for us, because you're gonna kill us. Right, yeah. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, somebody sharing a story, a story of the heartbreak of 1951. Sure. Um by the way, Bobby Thompson went home that night. Well, I mean, it's amazing that Stanky was pinch hit for even once that before in that TV. So for a second time, I don't quite get it. I mean, the leadoff hitter since time in memorial has been a guy who can hit or at least walk a lot or get hit by a pitch like Brian Hunt and Mets. It was there's something in particular. I mean, was not feeling well or no? <clears throat> yeah. The the question is why did the uh, Shotton pinch hit for Stanky in the fourth game of the forty seven World Series? Shotton wasn't much on giving explanations of why he did things. Um, you, you know, it's certainly you know he's the leadoff hitter. You would think that uh, it would make sense, but um, you know, and then the guy I looked it up. Labajetto didn't have a he had a pinch hit in September. I mean, he had a pinch hit in a month. But sometimes you just do those things, you know, and uh, it certainly worked out. Sounds about right. Yeah. Somebody sharing that the first, not not major league game, but the first overall game televised was a Columbia Princeton game. Yeah, the 1947 World Series was the first World Series that was televised, and it was only televised in a few places. Local newspaper. What? 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 What do we mean by local? I mean. <clears throat> I, I, you know, the New York, the, the New Jersey, I grew up in North Jersey, uh, the North and before the Dodgers and Giants left, the Newark papers covered the Dodgers and the Giants and the Yankees. And I guess they, they still, they still cover major league baseball. It's very different today. Yes. Is the, I guess the answer to the question. Yes. Yeah, well, no, not exhibition game. The question is about Roosevelt Stadium in Jersey City. Um, no, I never saw a game there. The Dodgers in their last couple years in Brooklyn played seven games a year. They were regular season games in Rose at Roosevelt Stadium in Jersey City, which wasn't much of a ballpark. Um, but it was part of O'Malley's gamesmanship. It was, you know, how you know, I want this new I I want the land for this new ballpark. And it was kind of the way, you know, if I play seven games there, maybe I'll play all my games there. Maybe I'll move my team there. Did you? Yeah. Yeah, it might at least 1957. I'm not sure if it was before that or not. Yeah. Hey. Sorry? Yeah, well, his, Jackie Robinson played for uh, Montreal in Jer Jersey. Jackie Robinson's first regular season game in organized baseball was played in Jersey City. Right, but he played for Montreal, which was the Dodgers. Right, that, and that's where they played each other, the opening game of the season. Robinson hit a home run. Yeah, one of the, uh, I'm the word I'm looking for, the, picture of George Shuba, who was the on-deck batter, shaking hands with Rob, iconic picture. 
uh, Shuba shaking hands with Robinson when he crossed home plate, just as, you know, another symbol of breaking the color line. The question is the longest home run ever hit at Ebbets Field and who hit it? I, the answer is I have my answers. I have no idea. You know, a lot of balls were hit out of Ebbets Field. Yeah, Bedford Avenue. Yeah, yeah. The right field fence is only like 290 feet away, so it wasn't hard to hit one over there. Basically, the, the situation was that O'Malley, he said he had the money to build a ballpark. What he need, and he said the Ebbets Field site wasn't adequate, so he needed land. And he, he the way it's always, even the O'Malley family to this day says that um, they, they, all they wanted was cooperation in assembling land. You know, loosely translated, that means give me the land. And Robert Moses was, <clears throat> by all accounts, the most powerful man in New York City, more, not an elected official, but more powerful than the mayor, more powerful in many respects than the governor. And he had access to all these government programs where, which would provide funding to acquire land. And, and, and Moses didn't like sports, didn't care about sports at all. O'Malley wanted Ro Moses to use a government, um, a government, federal government funding to acquire land that was the Fulton Fish Market. It's now where the um, the Nets play today and um, and buy the land there. And that's where the Dodgers would build their ballpark. And Moses took this strict strict construction of the rules that it wasn't fit, that wasn't appropriate. It couldn't do it. Of course, you know, it was something he wanted to do. He jumped up and down on the rules, but he didn't care. And uh, Robert Wagner didn't care. So that's what Moses' involvement with. Now, Dave Anderson, some of you may remember, a longtime columnist for the New York Times. I interviewed him for our book, and he said, people are going to tell you that uh, Moses is the one who stopped it. Don't believe him. O'Malley was the O'Malley was the O'Malley wanted to move to Los Angeles all along. Joe Adcock. OK, thank you, Michael. Um, Moses was not head of the park. I don't believe he was head of the park. Moses had a lot of titles that were all appointed titles, and some of them today that he consider conflicts, but enabled him to do things more quickly. That's correct. Um, can you X out that? Um... There we go. Okay. You see the sign there below the scoreboard. And yeah, it says it there. It's a little bit blurry. It says, hit sign, win suit. Now, the story is that when Carl Ferrillo played, he stood in front of the sign and nobody could hit, hit it. Now, Ralph Kiner said, my son interviewed Ralph Kiner, who said that uh, they, Stark should have given uh, Ferrillo a suit for protecting it. Now, there's an, another story about the sign that original picture I showed you with Casey Stengel in front of this, uh, there was a much bigger sign that was much easier to hit. And when they built the scoreboard, Stark, Stark opted for the smaller sign. But three people did hit it. So he did have to go give away three suits. Sorry? Carol's otherwise known as my wife. Um, Doris Kearns Goodwin. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know that. I know that. I'm not sure what specific question she's looking for. Yeah, Doris Kearns Goodwin wrote a book, uh, Wait Till Next Year, which is about growing up in in Brooklyn as a young girl and also as being a Dodger fan. Um, I got to interview Doris Kearns Goodwin uh, for our book, which was a big thrill. Um 
what happened. My wife is a huge fan of Doris Kearns Goodwin. And I knew I, if I knew if I said to my wife, do you want to want me to ask Doris if she'll speak to you? She'd be too embarrassed for me to do that. So we got to, I got to the end of the conversation with Doris and she said, I have to go away for a minute. And she came back to the phone and I called my wife over. I said, just wait here. And then I said to Doris Kearns Goodwin, uh, my wife's one of your biggest fans. Would you just say hello to her? And she said, of course, of course. And uh, so she got to speak to her. So that was a big thrill for her. I got to... Uh, I'll ask you to endure two stories about people I got to speak to. I got to speak to Robert Caro, who is the man who wrote the book about Robert Moses and is writing the God knows how many volume biography of uh, Lyndon Johnson. Caro has always been one of my literary heroes, and I really was a thrill. Um, okay. I'm not going to respond to that. But I promised my friend Mark Ranieri, who's here tonight, that I would tell the Carl Erskine story. Um, Carl Erskine was one of the players I interviewed for the book. And the way it worked with the Dodger players was you sent them a, sent them a letter with a return postcard, and they would tell you whether they would talk to you or not. And I got a postcard back from Carl Erskine saying, call me at this number. So I'm home by myself, and I called the number. And it was obviously a cell phone. And I got a message. This is Carl Erskine. I'm not available right now. And there was no way to leave a, leave a message. So, that, all right, I'll call, I'll try again tomorrow. So it was this time of year. So I'll go outside and rake some leaves. I'm literally walking out the door to rake leaves. And the phone rings. Hi, it's Carl Erskine. I saw you call. And he's calling me from Indiana, not collect. Okay. So we talk for about 45 minutes. And finally, he says, well, I think I've probably taken up enough of your time. I said, there is no way that you've taken up too much of my time. So we talk another 15 minutes and the conversation ends. So now, of course, my wife is still not home. I'm looking for some of my friends outside. They're not around. Again, I'm getting ready to go outside and rake leaves. The phone rings again. Hi, it's Carl Erskine. I forgot something. Now, what he forgot to tell me was about Gladys Gooding. He said, Gladys Gooding, the song that she played more than any other at Ebbets Field was, of course, the national anthem. But the one that she played second most was back home in Indiana, because Erskine was from Indiana, Hodges was from Indiana, and Billy Herman was from Indiana, and she played it for them. And so that was, uh, that was the last thing he had to tell me. It was a great story. Well, Jen, he's still alive, one of six surviving Brooklyn Dodgers. He's in it well into his 90s. Um, and what a gentleman. What a gentleman. Uh, there are three books. Um, this is one. They're all available on Amazon. This is the Ebbets Field book, es Essays and Memories of Brooklyn's Historic Ballpark. It consists of essays in the first half, and the second half are the memories of players, fans, and other people who went to Ebbets Field. My son and I co-authored a book called The Making the the the, the national league the, the the major league pennant races of 1916, which is the first year the Dodgers won the national league pennant in the 20th century, and my biography of Charles Ebbets, the man behind the Dodgers and Brooklyn's beloved ballpark. All of them are available on Amazon. I thought you were going to ask me what was the term. When did the terms "dodgers" become in use? Um, the term "bums," I'm going to guess, is in the late 1930s when they're, you know, they're clowns. You know, they're the daffiness boys. Uh, you know, they weren't called. The, they had many names besides the Dodgers. Um, and, uh, Wilbur Robinson was the manager of the Dodgers from the 1914 through for like 20 years, and for years they were called the Robins. And if you look at the New York newspapers for the last game at Ebbets Field, they refer to the Dodgers as the flock. So, you know, you had to have more. You couldn't just use Dodgers. You had more names than that. So you had one more back there?
Yes. I wrote one book about the Civil War, a, um, <clears throat> a regimental history of the 33rd New Jersey, one of New Jersey's 40 Civil War regiments. Um, that, that was my first book, also available on Amazon. Why did I choose that topic? Why that regiment? Why that regiment? That's an, my wife must have planted that story, that question with you. I had the regiment. There had there was no prior regimental history, but there was this talk. You would see these fleeting comments of books about the con the controversial beginnings of the 33rd New Jersey and their um, their legendary experiences in the war. And so I decided I was going to write a book about the 33rd New Jersey. I was working full time and my son in middle school and I stopped. And this is before the internet. So you had to go and do research. This wasn't working. I said, all right, I'm, I can't do this. I give up. My son was a student at St. Benedict's Prep in Newark. And the, in the summer, they do uh, enriched courses. And he did it. He took a course on the Civil War. And he comes home one day and he says, Dad, you got to get me a book on 33rd New Jersey. So, well, clearly, I was fated to write a book about the 33rd New Jersey. So, Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, uh, no, at that time, the Rocher was the manager of the Dodgers. Yes, yeah. The question is about a quote um, from Leo DeRocher that nice guys finish last. And it happened in a game. I don't know whether it was at Ebbets Field or the Polo Grounds, but it was the Dodgers and the Giants. DeRocher was the manager of the Dodgers. Mel Ott was the manager of the Giants. And I don't know about players. It was The question was more to do with managers. And, and DeRo DeRocher has a book um, co-written with, I think it was Ed Lynn called Nice Guys Finish Last. And in the beginning, he explains what he meant by that. It's not as draconian as it sounds, but, um, you know, DeRocher is a strength, you know, DeRocher is somebody I don't think I could take very much, but players, his players loved him, would do anything for him. So he had, you know, um, something about him. So it was in a reporter who was interviewed, a bunch of reporters who were talking to DeRocher and it, it had to, it was, I think it was more about, you know, why aren't you more of a nice guy? And, you know, uh, but you know, what does that mean? And um, it's it really, it's explained in the book. I mean, it explains what he means. So Met well, Mel Ott was the, I don't, I think he probably did have a reputation as a nice guy. He was not a success. He was a great player, but not a successful manager. Um, and his team was in last place. And I think he was fired when DeRocher and then DeRocher took over. Okay, thank you.